Hey everyone, I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. Welcome to part two of my series, Responding to Rationality Rules video on the Kalam Cosmological Argument. If you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to do so. There's a lot of important information in there. If you need the link to the playlist of all three, check for it in the description. As a quick reminder, Stephen's video has a total of six subjections to the Kalam. The first two are against the conclusion, the next two are against the argument, and then the last two are against proponents of the argument. Part one of this series deals with objections one and two, part two deals with objections three and four, part three deals with objections five and six. So let's now turn to Stephen's third and fourth objections that the Kalam equivocates on the term universe and that everything is a result of creation out of material. To help me out with Stephen's third objection, I've invited another Christian apologist on, Blake Junta, to help me out with this. Actually, he and Stephen did a debate on the Kalam cosmological argument a little while ago on the Unbelievable Show, which I've linked in the description if you want to check it out. All right, so let's watch Stephen's third objection and then Blake's response. One of the most critical flaws with this argument, and one that isn't always recognized, is that it commits a subtle but devastating equivocation fallacy. It does this because the argument switches between two different definitions of the universe throughout its premises in order to achieve its conclusion. During premise two, the argument uses a scientific definition of the universe, that being all matter, space, and time. But during premise 3, it uses a colloquial and or theological definition of the universe, that being, everything that exists, everything that has existed, and everything that will exist. The key difference here being, that when we say that the universe began to exist using the scientific definition of the universe, what we are saying is that all matter, and by extension all of space and time, began to exist in the way it does now. What we are not saying is that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. But when we say that the universe began to exist using the colloquial definition of the universe, we are indeed saying that absolutely everything came into being from absolutely nothing. Okay, so, uh, wow. Um, so when Craig and all of these academic uh, professors and, and proponents of this argument from around the world use this argument, um, are they equivocating over the term universe. Are they using it one way in one premise and then concluding uh, using it a different way? Um, short answer, no. That That's just uh, irresponsibly absurd. Um, Craig and everybody, to my awareness, has consistently, in talking about the Kalam, defined it as all of contiguous space and time, or all of space, time, reality, all of space and time. And that's how I define it, too, on my side. I've never heard of this... Um, quote unquote, theological definition. And I've read enough of the academic literature to know that if it were anywhere uh, ever used, I, I, at least I'll say I'm pretty confident I would have come across it. This is a term that Stephen made up. And really, this is just so absurd when you think about it, right? I mean, it's an accident on Stephen's part, but I, I still want to call attention to the absurdity of it. So go to the conclusion, right, uh, that therefore the universe has a cause. And think about what it would mean if Stephen were right, if we really meant by universe everything. So we're saying in the conclusion, therefore, everything has a cause. Well, that would very quickly imply we're saying that God has a cause because God's part of everything. And that's, I mean, that's absurd. This is an argument that's put forward by academics all over the globe. What's going on here? Um, similarly, remember that second part? Um, of the argument where we go on to say that whatever caused the universe obviously exists independently of space, time, and matter. That doesn't make any sense unless by universe we meant all of space, time, and matter, right? I mean, so what's going on here? Where is this the theological definition coming from? I've never heard that in my life. Nobody says that. So basically what Blake is pointing out is that there's no theological definition of the universe. Now, it seems to me that what Stephen is trying to say is that our reasons for thinking that the observable universe began to exist doesn't mean that the universe as a whole or all physical reality began to exist. In other words, maybe the Big Bang was like the start of our universe, but there was something physical that existed prior to the Big Bang. Now, if that's what Stephen is saying, then he's really just objecting to premise two of the argument. He doesn't think that all physical reality began to exist. So let me give just three quick points on this. First, possibility is really, really cheap. 
It's technically possible that aliens are like operating on your brain right now, making you think that you're watching a video on capturing Christianity when in reality your brain is like laying open on an operating table. Like that's possible, it's technically possible, but it's not reasonable. Likewise, it's technically possible that something existed prior to the Big Bang, but that doesn't make it reasonable. Second, according to theoretical physicist Alexander Vilenkin, we have no viable models of an eternal universe. In a recent article, he wrote, quote, the answer to the question, did the universe have a beginning, is it probably did. We have no viable models of an eternal universe. The bourdais guth vilenkin theorem gives us reason to believe that such models simply cannot be constructed. And see the link in the description if you want to see his quote in its full context. His point, though, is very obvious. Cosmologists have no viable models of an eternal universe. My third point is that there are non-scientific reasons for thinking that the universe began to exist. I actually went over one of them in part one of this series. Very briefly, an actually infinite number of things, like an actually infinite number of causes, can't exist in reality. So even if there were something prior to the Big Bang, it couldn't have existed forever, and so premise two is still true. All right, so let's move on to Stephen's fourth objection, that everything is the result of creation out of material. And you know what? I liked Blake's response so much to the last objection, I think that he should actually help us out here too. So let's do it. Take it away, Stephen, and then Blake. And this brings us comfortably to another critical flaw with the Kalam cosmological argument. It asserts that something can indeed come from nothing a concept in philosophy known as creatio ex nihilio, creation out of nothing, when this has never been demonstrated to occur. In fact, to the contrary, everything we know about cause and effect overwhelmingly and unanimously tells us that when a new thing is created, it is due to the rearrangement of energy and matter that already existed. That is, everything is the result of creatio ex materia, creation out of material. The truth is that we have no evidence whatsoever to suggest that the universe, as defined by science, was created from absolutely nothing. And hence, the extraordinary claim that something can come from nothing requires extraordinary evidence. And yet the best response the proponents of this argument have offered so far is the assertion that absolutely everything began to exist at the Big Bang which again, simply isn't what the evidence suggests. In the next part of the video here, Stephen has some complaints about creation ex nihilo, that's how you're supposed to pronounce it, uh, creation out of nothing. Um, if you're sharp, you'll notice that neither premise one nor premise two of the Kalam imply by itself that there is a creation out of nothing. It's only when you put them together that you get creation out of nothing. So at the end of the day, Stephen's objection here is not an objection to the argument, right? He's not going after either premise. He has a complaint about the conclusion, okay? And I could stop there because that means it doesn't belong in his video. He could have just made it a completely independent video with all his complaints about theism and the things theism entails. Great, but it doesn't belong in that video. But uh, this is a response video, so I guess I should say something. Um, and I'll, I'll start this way. Um, the only way that you're going to find Stephen's complaint here acceptable is if you are already Stephen or someone who shares Stephen's worldview, right? Because if you're a theist like me, you already believe in immaterial causation, right? You already believe that uh, a non-material object, namely God or souls, uh, can cause things to be. God uh, causes his own mental states. He causes miracles. We believe God causes the universe. I believe I'm an immaterial thing at bottom that causes things. Um, at the end of the day, I see no arguments against immaterial causation. Um, and only if I accept that the world is like Stephen says it is, uh, which I don't, uh, would this be at all compelling. So it's not a fallacy. It's just Stephen's uh, belief system. So Blake's point is that Stephen is begging the question when he says that everything is a result of creation out of material. There are even some atheist philosophers like Robert Howell and Thomas Nagel that think that mental events are non-physical. And so for them, consciousness isn't made out of like pre-existing material. And so mental events like thoughts begin to exist without material causes. But you don't have to reject materialism in order to reject Stephen's modified principle. Remember, how in part one I said that by limiting his discussion to the core syllogism, 
Stephen is missing out on potential answers to all of his objections. And this right here is a perfect example. The broader discussion of the Kalam reveals that his modified principle is already false. In other words, it doesn't pose a problem to the Kalam at all. And now I realize that this isn't super apparent, so just give me a minute to explain what I mean. It's crucial to point out that if everything that begins to exist comes from previously existing material, then previously existing material must always exist. If you're always creating new things from things that already exist, then things have to always exist for eternity past. This is an undeniable consequence of Stephen's modified principle. To see why this reasoning is fallacious, Let's apply the same logic to humans and see where we end up. Consider the following argument. Premise 1. If every human has human parents, then humans did not begin to exist. Premise 2. Every human has human parents. Conclusion. Therefore, humans did not begin to exist. What? No, actually, premise 1 is obviously true. If all humans have human parents, then this must go on for eternity past. And premise two is actually really plausible given our experience. Every human in our experience has human parents. So it seems perfectly natural to conclude that all humans have human parents, right? But then it follows that humans didn't begin to exist. Now obviously this is a really bad argument, but let me take a moment and explain why it's a bad argument. I mean, it actually seemed like a good idea at first. All humans in our experience have human parents, so it, we probably should conclude that all humans have human parents. The problem is that we have evidence against that claim. If you're a creationist, for example, you think that God specially created humans. And if you're an evolutionist, you probably believe that humans began to exist around 200,000 years ago. And so while the original inference actually seemed like a pretty good idea at first, your total evidence actually disconfirms it. So here's how we should reason. Premise four, if every human has human parents, then humans did not begin to exist. And this statement is true, so we don't need to reject or change it. Premise five, humans began to exist. And we all agree on this premise because again, it's supported by our total evidence. And then from there, the conclusion follows, it is not the case that every human has human parents. That's how we should reason. And so in response to Stephen's claim that everything that begins to exist has a material cause or comes from pre-existing material, we can run a very similar argument. Premise seven, if everything that begins to exist is made from pre-existing material, then the universe did not begin to exist. And remember, this premise must be true. If everything is created from previously existing material, then this must go on for eternity. Premise eight, the universe began to exist. Look familiar? Conclusion, therefore, it is not the case that everything that begins to exist is made from pre-existing material. Notice that premise eight is identical to the second premise in the Kalam. Thus, any argument that we have in support of the Kalam's second premise equally supports premise eight in this argument. In short, the Kalam has already debunked Stephen's objection we don't have to do anything else. This just goes to show that you've got to be really careful when you want to go around claiming that you've debunked an argument. To summarize, in response to Stephen's third objection, that the Kalam is guilty of equivocation, we saw that there's no such thing as a theological definition of the universe. The charge of equivocation is just misguided. Then we saw that A, the mere possibility of an infinite past is not enough to make it reasonable that the past is infinite. B, according to Alexander Vilenkin, cosmologists have no viable models of an eternal universe. And then C, an infinite number of things can't exist in reality. A, B, and C together imply that all physical reality had a beginning. In response to Stephen's fourth objection, that everything is a result of creation out of pre-existing material, we saw that Stephen is begging the question in favor of materialism. And then we saw that his principle is actually already refuted by the Kalam argument itself. 
I mean, it's just a really poor objection. All right, guys, thanks for watching part two of this series. If you've been enjoying the content so far, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications. The next part in this series, part three, is just as juicy as parts one and two. Stephen's last two objections are that proponents of the Kalam are guilty of special pleading and that they argue that we don't know, therefore God. So if you're already in the playlist, just sit tight. You'll be taken to part three automatically. But if not, check for the link in the description. Oh, and uh, I, I did want to tell you guys something important. Jesus rose bodily from the dead.